All right, everyone, this is the second video that I am recording uh, for Thursday's lecture, and this is more about the practical side of object detection. It's kind of a brief video, and we'll also, you know, spend a lot of class talking about, about the practical side of things, and of course, any questions that you guys have about the frameworks as well. Um, but if you are watching this video and you have not yet watched the first video about object detection frameworks, please go watch that first, and so that you'll understand um, you'll understand what's in this video better if you know what object detection is and what things like faster RCNN are doing. Okay, um, but okay, the practical side of object detection. Um, and um, so in economics, a really powerful application of object detection is to recognizing document layouts. And so essentially this is called document image analysis. We start with some documents and we have some convoluted uh, or simple, <laughs> you know, pipeline, and then we want to get out structured output. Um, and um, so this requires taking our documents and being able to classify what sorts of objects are in them. So it might be row headers and column headers and cells and the table header of a, a table. It could be newspapers and headline. Uh, in newspapers, it could be like headlines and captions and article text boxes and advertisements, etc. Um, and so we want to recognize the layouts um, that are present in our documents, and then we can take those and OCR them. And if we don't recognize the layouts, like, um, you know, if we don't recognize this is a table cell, this is a table header, this is a column header, um, we won't be able to extract structured data from the documents. And so previously, you know, when we started working on this a few years ago, there was no full-fledged infrastructure for easily curating document image data sets and fine-tuning uh, or retraining layout analysis models. Um, the relevant resources, to the extent they existed, were in different repositories and used inconsistent backends and APIs. Um, so just to give an example, um, you know, you need to pre-process your data, and you could do that in Java, and then to do the layout detection, that's in PyTorch, um, and then character recognition, you might use Tesseract and calls. You need to call that using C++, and then post-processing, maybe there'd be a relevant repository, but that was in MATLAB, and then you also have to store the data. Um, and so this leads to pipelines that are quite convoluted. They're not very reproducible, and it's not very accessible to people who don't have a super strong background in programming. And there's lots of people in the social sciences and in the humanities who would like to use these tools, uh, but they're not like um, by training a programmer. They don't have a lot of experience, say, um, in computer science. And so it's just it wasn't very accessible. And so I worked with. Predox, uh, Zhejiang Shen, and Jake Carlson, um, and open source collaborators to integrate the models and tools that we developed um, into an open source package called Layout Parser. Um, and the aim of Layout Parser is to streamline the use of deep learning and document image analysis pipelines. So Layout Parser provides simple and intuitive interfaces for applying and customizing deep learning models for layout detection and other document processing tasks. And so we aim to make Layout Parser simple, comprehensible, customizable, extensible, um, and open source. And so Layout Parser has an off-the-shelf toolkit for applying deep learning models for layout detection, character recognition, and other document image analysis tasks. This is supported by a repository of pre-trained neural network models, or the model zoo that underlies the off-the-shelf usage. And it also has comprehensive tools for efficient document image data annotation and model tuning to support different levels of customization. The entire library is implemented with simple Python APIs. So it's straightforward to install. As I think I've said before, do not install this on Windows. Like, it's just... Don't do anything with deep learning on Windows. It's just not a good idea. You will make your life so much harder. If possible, please like go do this on Colab. Um, you know, um, it's just it's gonna run there. Um, it, it it's it's not gonna run on Windows. Okay, deep learning is not meant to be done on Windows. If you do this on Colab or maybe some other cloud platform, you'll just save yourself um, a lot of effort of resolving dependencies. Um, so this is what you would do to use Layout Parser off the shelf um, on this particular image, which is a page of the Layout Parser paper. And so you can see it can literally detect the layouts, what they are, where the bounding boxes are, and what their classes are with just three lines of code. So let's break down what this code is. Um, and so you have to specify the model configuration, which consists of a training data set. And so this particular, um, for this particular image, it was trained on PubLinet, um, which is academic articles. 
Um, so that's the data that the model was trained on. Um, and this is the model architecture. So you can see here, this is mask our CNN of depth 50 um, with a feature pyramid network. You know, things we all talked about in the first half of this lecture. Um, the back end um, is the Tactron 2. Um, and uh, then uh, you call the standardized model detection API. So suppose we want to make some changes. OK, well, I just now change uh, mask our CNN to faster our CNN, which there's a model for. And now I changed what it was trained on um, from PubLayNet, which is like academic articles, to Primo layout, which is magazines. Um, and now I changed the back end from Detectron 2 to Paddle Detection. OK, so this is the model zoo. Um, these are models, some of them we did, um, and some of them were contributed, like Ben Lee contributed the newspaper navigator uh, model, which is a model he designed. It doesn't detect the articles of newspapers, but it detects the headlines and images and captions. Um, and um, you know, this is open source, and if anybody has layout detection models that they use layout parser to train, we very much value you contributing your, your model weights, um, and other people working with document images might find that very beneficial in the future. Um, and so in determining how layout parser can meet your needs, it's important to ask three questions. How different is the target data you would like to process from the pre-trained models? So if it looks very different than the pre-trained models, the pre-trained models are not going to do great on it, and you're going to need to train your own model. What are your accuracy and efficiency requirements? And how much training data are available? Um, and so multi-backend support helps users to make the right accuracy efficiency trade-off. So let's suppose um, that your target data looks a lot like the, you know, one of the pre-trained uh, models that we have, and you really care about being efficient. Um, so this might be a typical scenario for like a student paper for a class. Um, well, then you might want to use the efficient detection backend um, and one of the pre-trained models. Um, you know, on the other hand, maybe your data is super different from our pre-trained models and you really care about being accurate. Um, you know, so in that case, you're going to need to train your own model and maybe you want to use Detectron too. You know, I should say there's some other backends. So like MM Detection is another backend that we've like worked a lot with in our work recently, but we just haven't integrated it into Layout Parser yet. You know, I should add that if anybody in the class, um, you know, really enjoys making open source contributions and would like to contribute something like that to Layout Parser, we're super open um, to um, open source contributions. But as of now, these are the backends that are available. All right, so that's Layout Parser, um, and we can talk more about it in class um, if anybody would like. Um, so now I want to say a word about annotation. And as you guys know, um, oftentimes the most challenging part of uh, deep learning is doing the annotation um, and doing it in a way that's efficient um, so that you're able to get the most out of your label data and able to make the labeling requirements reasonable. Um, so document images often have intricate layout structures with numerous content regions. So they might have text, figures, tables that are densely arranged on, arranged on each page. And this makes manual annotation of layout data sets really expensive and inefficient. Um, and so this is a prime context for introducing active learning. So we talked about active learning quite a bit last class when we were discussing text classification. And now I want to talk about active learning um, in the context um, of, um, of uh, doing a document layout analysis. So active learning methods typically score and select samples at the image level rather than at the object level. And for category and balanced layout uh, images, this uh, could suffer from overexposure of common objects. Um, and so let's say, you know, a bunch of the objects on your image are very straightforward and you already have enough labels for them, but your labeling is at the image level. So if you selected the image level to get the one thing that you can learn a lot from, you're going to also have to label everything else in that image. That might not be a big deal if you're working with Coco and there's three objects per image, but if you're working with a, a document where there's 300 objects per image, that's going to be very costly. Um, and so there's some methods um, at the object level that do active learning at the object level, um, but they don't apply to documents because they rely on things like being able to shift um, around um, an object to another place in the image, and that doesn't work in documents because 
the objects tend to be very dense on a page. Um, so think of a newspaper, there's like objects covering the entire page. And so if you try to shift an object around, it's gonna be on top of another object. Um, and so just to kind of summar summarize um, the challenges that we face. So layout regions can follow a long tail distribution where the frequency of different samples differ substantially. So you see like in the belly of the distribution, you know, you have lots and lots of say, let's say we're labeling newspapers. You have lots of fairly clean article bounding boxes. Um, and those make up a lot of your objects. So if you're just sampling at random to label, you're very quickly going to have enough ob objects labeled for these straightforward objects, like the standard newspaper articles. But then you also have these long tails, um, and there's lots of idiosyncratic things in the long tails. So if we randomly sample images for labeling, um, the time distribution is, exact, is approximately the same as the layout distribution, whereas what we'd like to do is to oversample the tails, um, but the problem is that the layout distribution is unobserved ex ante. Like, how do we figure out what's the most informative sample to label when we don't observe that distribution in our unlabeled data because it's unlabeled data? Um, okay, so we're going to look at um, applying an active learning method um, to uh, three different uh, sets of documents. Um, this is PubLayNet, which is a benchmark for uh, document layout detection. Primo, which is another small benchmark, it's from magazines. And then this HJ data set, um, which is a benchmark data set that we put together from historical Japanese biographies. Um, and we're gonna develop um, different methods um, uh, and evaluate different methods for doing active learning on these documents. This is work that is in EMNLP um, that's also joint uh, with Sejin Shen um, and other collaborators. Um, so inspired by recent uh, progress in semi-supervised learning and self-training, um, we propose uh, what we call OLALA, Object Level Active Learning, um, Framework for Efficient Document Layout Annotation. Um, and it's the first active learning framework designed specifically for documents. And so in this framework, only regions with the most ambiguous object predictions within an image are selected for annotators to label, which optimizes the use of the annotation budget. For unselected predictions, um, you know, in evaluating this, we use a semi-automatic correction algorithm uh, to identify uh, certain errors based on prior knowledge of layout structures and to rectify them with minor supervision. Okay, um, and so this is an illustration of the OLALA framework. Uh, during labeling for an input image, a trained model predicts the layouts with various errors, and an object scoring function evaluates the informative for each um, object prediction. Um, and OLALA se selects the regions of top scores, the ones that are scored as being the most likely to be informative for labeling, and sends them for manual labeling. Um, and um, a semi-automatic prediction correction algorithm is applied to rectify duplicated objects and recover false negatives. You know, so we, when we're doing experiments, um, we impose some costs for doing that. You know, in practice, if you're a human doing this, um, you get past an image and there's uncertain objects on the image and you need to rectify those predictions, but you're gonna quickly check the other predictions to make sure that nothing's duplicated or missing. Okay, and so we're trying to kind of simulate that um, in the context of evaluating these different methods. Um, after this process, the final annotation is obtained with labeling only part of the objects on a page. Um, and so instead of pulling out an image and labeling everything on that image, with OLALA, you're gonna run a pre-trained model and you're gonna have predictions and it's going to highlight um, which of the objects on the page are most informative for you to annotate. And then you just quickly check the other predictions um, to make sure that there's not duplicates or, um, or things that are missing. Um, and so for a given labeling budget, we show that substantially higher accuracy can be achieved with active learning and a data set of the same size can be created with significantly less human effort. So at the core of OLALA is an object scoring function that gives us a quantitative measure of how informative it would be to label each object. Um, and so we design a perturbation-based object scoring function that is designed specifically uh, for document image. So um, it governs the object selection process via evaluating the ambiguities of prediction. Um, considering both the positions and categories of predicted layout objects. So um, 
we use a perturbation-based scoring method based on both the bounding boxes and category predictions to account for specific characteristics and layout detection ta tasks. And the method hypothesizes that the adjacent image patches share similar features vectors and the predicted object boxes and categories from them should be consistent. Any large discrepancy um, between original and perturbed predictions indicates that the model is insufficiently trained for this type of input um, or that there's some sort of anomalies in your sample, both of which demand user attention. So let me be more specific about what we do. Um, so we take um, object predictions, um, you know, that come out of that um, region proposal network um, that we talked about in the first part of this lecture when we saw um, FAST or RCNN. Um, and we're going to take those um, initial proposals and we're going to slightly perturb them. Um, so the new boxes are created by a horizontal and vertical translation um, by some amount, some small amount. Um, and um, then the model takes those region proposals and generates new box and category predictions. And then we then measure the disagreement between the original prediction and the perturbed versions and use it as a criterion for selecting objects for labeling. So in short, you know, we saw in the first half of this lecture uh, that in an object detection framework like MaskR CNN, you have this initial region proposal network and it gives you proposals and then you refine the coordinates of those proposals and you predict their class. And the idea behind this um, active learning method is if you slightly shift those pro initial proposed boxes over, it should give you a similar prediction, right? It should refine them to the correct one and give you the same class. And if it doesn't, that's indicative of um, the fact that the model does not know how to deal with this sort of image. Um, in practice, we build this method upon a typical object detection architecture composed of a region proposal network and a region classification and improvement network um, that predicts the category and modifies the box predictions based on the input proposals. And so we just use the perturbed boxes as the new inputs for the ROI heads um, and mask our CNN or faster our CNN, and that gives us the new box and class predictions. Um, and then we can measure the disagreement um, between um, uh, the um, boxes in between the categories and use that to compute overall disagreement where we have a weighting constant to add up the disagreement and the bounding box predictions and the disagreement in the class. Um, and the objects that have larger disagreement are prioritized for labeling. Um, so the proposed method evaluates the box and category prediction robustness and can effectively identify um, false uh, positive object predictions. Um, Incorrect category predictions will tend to cause high discrepancy um, as well. Um, all right. Um, and so we test this approach. Um, and you know we, ha we start with these kind of um, uh, labeled data sets. Um, and this is kind of in general how you would evaluate an active learning approach, right? You already know the ground truth labels, but you have this kind of large unlabeled data set. And then you can use different methods to pull out samples to move from your unlabeled data to your labeled data and you evaluate um, model performance on training on your labels. Um, and so um, importantly, the method that I've showed you doesn't have a way to identify false negatives. Um, and um, so what this figure shows is that um, Olala, like um, the baseline algorithm does very well. That's the green. If you don't remove duplicates, it's not a big deal. Um, but if you don't have missing annotation recovery, then the performance really declines because then the model starts like trying to learn that you don't want specific objects to be recognized on the page and it gets very confused. Um, and so sort of what this means kind of in practice is that um, so you have um, the algorithm tells you which objects are most likely to need your attention on the image, but the labeling does happen at the image level. And so when you see that image to annotate, you do need to pay attention um, to whether there's missing objects on the page. And if you don't, that's going to be problematic. Um, so in practice, using Olala required integrating it and its features into an open source labeling software called Label Studio. Um, and so these are the features that we created within Label Studio to make it easier to implement Olala. 
Um, and so you see in panel A, there's a pre-trained model for detecting newspaper layouts, and you can see it's kind of problematic. Some of the green boxes chop off part of the article, or there's like a headline box that's missing altogether. Um, and, um, you know, so the model will predict um, uh, some objects that require attention, um, and those can be highlighted. And so you can highlight different objects um, by the percentile of their Olala score using our modifications to label Studio. Um, and then we also made a modification to label Studio that um, allows you to make the bounding boxes um, completely opaque, which makes it very easy to see where you forgot boxes. And remember, like, um, correcting um, missing annotations is important, and with in panel C, that makes that as efficient as possible. And so then you get panel D, which is your corrected annotations. And it's much, much faster to do this than to annotate everything in the image from scratch. Um, and um, so, you know, this, our uh, version of Label Studio is available with a code base. You know, by now it's like a couple of years old. <laughs> Um, you know, so you might be better off kind of if you want to use this, just looking at it and integrating that into the updated version of Label Studio, which gets constantly updated and it's impossible to kind of fully, fully keep up with it um, for us. Uh, but that code base is there. Um, and uh, so, yeah, just to recap, the basic idea is that it's very, very costly to label every object in a document image. Um, and we get kind of over-representation of some objects, under-representation of others. So what Olala does is, first of all, it creates this score that comes from perturbating um, those uh, proposals. Um, and then you see how much the prediction for the bounding box in the class differs when you perturbate those proposals a little bit. Big difference means it's more likely to be informative for labeling. Um, and um, so in practice, um, you can create an interface that shows you kind of which objects and highlights which objects on the page are most likely to be informative. Um, you know, you could also take the average object score over every object in the image and use that to pick things out. You could choose images that where the 90th percentile of that object score is the highest, et cetera. You know, it gives you very fine-grained information about object uncertainty in order to pick uh, images to label. You know, of course, object detection is trained at the image level, so you need to correct the incorrect predictions, and you need to make sure that there's no missing predictions, which panel C, the opacity there, helps you to do efficiently. So this was a quick introduction to active learning um, for um, uh, object detection methods um, for doing document layout analysis, um, and I really look forward to talking about um, this uh, more in class on Thursday. Um, so this is all I have um, on um, on the practical side of document layout analysis, and I really look forward to talking about this more with everybody soon. Thank you.